cut loose. And then the Congressman Leo Ryan looked down and he saw that what the man held in his left hand, pressed up against his chest near his heart, was a sharp knife, the blade about that long with a serrated edge, pressed right up against his heart. And then he looked down, he grabbed his wrist and he said, help. At that point, I, I saw that it was not a joke. I didn't, know what, I didn't know he had a knife in his hand because he was still away from me and I couldn't see it. But I ran up to him, took two steps, and put my hand under the wrist, my thumb under the wrist, and pulled as hard as I could. And, and I don't know how long it lasted. I'm sure it seemed a lot longer than it really was, but it seemed like a long time. And I kept on saying, hit him, somebody hit him, because I thought if somebody hit him with a club or a board or something that on the head, that would be the end of the struggle. And nobody did. There was a large crowd of people standing around. Nobody did anything for what seemed like a very long time. And I knew I couldn't do anything but keep my hand on that wrist to keep the knife from going into the congressman's heart. I held it there. Finally, some people got behind the man whose name I found out later was Don Sly, put their arms around his throat from the back, pulled him back, and in the struggle, he fell back onto them. The congressman fell onto him, and I fell onto the congressman with my wrist, my hands, thumb still there, and I felt something pop in my thumb, but I knew I had to keep it there, and finally the knife was dislodged. And the man was taken away. I didn't see him disappear, but he disappeared. I was looking at the congressman, there was blood on the right side of his shirt and a little bit on his right pant leg. And I said, are you all right? And he said, I don't know. I don't know, Mark. And I said, have you been wounded? He said, I don't know. My hand, I saw later, had a slight little cut on it, but a slight cut and could not have been responsible for all of that blood. Don Sly's hand, as it turns out, was very badly cut, and that was Don Sly's blood. And I said, are you, but I didn't know that then. I said, and he didn't know it either, the congressman. I said, are you all right? He said, I don't know. And he got up and he sat down on a bench, right near the bench where he had been questioning people the night before. And I said, are you wounded? And he said, I don't know. And I opened his shirt and I looked and saw that there was no, not even a scratch. And I said, I think we'd better get the doctor here. And he said, I don't need a doctor. And I said to Jim Jones, who was sitting right there watching me, for the first time, he was remarkably calm. And in looking back, I guess it's my speculation now that he had made a decision. All the problems had been resolved. In his mind, he decided what to do. And he, was, he said, does this change everything, Congressman? And he said, yes, it does. Then he caught himself and said, he was almost in a state of shock, the Congress. He said, well, no, not, it changes some things. Not everything. It changes some things. There will still be a balanced report. I'm going to talk about this attack, but uh, it's not going to overshadow everything. And I said, get a doctor, Jim. And the congressman said, no, we don't, I don't need a doctor. I said, get a doctor. And he went to, he said, yes, somebody get a doctor. Get Larry. The doctor never came. The congressman said, what happened to that man slide? Did the police take him? Of course, there were no police in there. And I said to Jim Jones, call the Port Kaituma police. This is a very serious crime, and have it reported to them at once so they can come and take custody of that man. He said, yes, we'll get the police. The police were never called. At that point, Mr. Dwyer of the American Embassy, oh, then the next thing that happened was that Don Harris had heard something, came running over, and he saw the blood all over the congressman's shirt and his pants, and he said, stay there, I'll be right back with the TV crew, the film crew. And I said, Don, don't come with the film crew. And all the years that I've given advice of various kinds to the news media, that's the first time anyone have ever, has ever taken it. And he said, OK. And it he, he, he was clear to him that the situation was uh, past redemption or close to it. And he certainly didn't want, want to be the person who pushed it over the edge. And so he went back to the truck. I, at least he disappeared from there. And Mr. Dwyer of the American Embassy came over and said, Congressman, I think instead of your staying next extra day, I should take your place. I'll go back with you into the Port Kaituma airstrip in the truck and arrange for another plane for tomorrow for Mark and for myself. He said, Mark, will you stay here an extra day with me? And I said, yes. He said, well, you stay here, and I'll go back into Port Kaituma, and I'll arrange for a plane, and I'll be back a little bit later in the day. And I said, all right, realizing that the only two non-members of People's Temple then in the entire place were Charles Gary and myself. That was not terribly reassuring, but they all left on the truck at that point. I was by myself for a little while, and I began to think about what that all meant. And as I thought about it then and later, I thought, you know, that guy never tried to kill Congressman Ryan. At the time, it sure seemed that way to me, that that's what he was trying to do. I was in the middle of it. But as I looked back on it with some reflection, I said to myself, he never tried to kill him. 
He could have stuck that knife in his back five or six times or more before we could have done anything. We're not trained Secret Service agents, and even they, as we have seen, are not all that effective on these matters, unfortunately. He certainly could have stuck the knife in his heart several times from the front before we could have responded, but he didn't. He held them, told them what he was going to do, and didn't do anything except tell them. I thought, my God, it seems to me now that if this guy is a friend of Jim Jones's, I don't know, I didn't know that. It turns out he was his friend for years. Charles Gary had represented him in a workman's compensation case some years before. He was a very close friend of Jim Jones, a truck driver, a very strong man. I knew he was strong. I didn't know the rest at that point. I thought if he was a friend of Jim Jones, then maybe Jim told him to kill the congressman. It's not easy to kill someone if you're not a killer. Congress was a very warm, friendly person, very affable, never did a single thing in there which was of, of a provocative nature other than to be there and to conduct a responsible investigation. But he was warm and friendly in talking to people. And it was probably very hard to stick a knife in his back or in his chest. I thought, what probably happened is that Jones said to him, kill him. And he couldn't say no to his leader. On the other hand, he couldn't do it. So he made believe he tried to follow out the orders but didn't really try to kill. And I thought, that's probably what happened. I thought, oh my God, if that's what happened, if Jones has reached the point where he ordered the congressman to be killed, this is probably beyond any, any the moment where we can retrieve anything now. At which point Jones called Charles Gary and me together. He called a meeting of everybody. They were all were going to the big pavilion. He took us to a little pavilion across this little road from it. And he said, after, uh, he, he started by saying, as I look back on it now, I think he had, of course, he had already decided that everyone was to die there. And he, I think he wanted to know whether Charles Gary and I were going to speak out against the proposal. And I, I think that's what he was doing. I don't know that. But he said, Charles, Mark, everything's terrible. He handed us a ticking bomb. He said, everything's terrible. The congressman is going to go back and he's going to say, I ordered that assault on him. That's what he's going to say. And then they'll come in here and destroy us. And I didn't. I'm innocent. But that's what they'll believe. I said, no, they won't. Look, I, ca I walked with the congressman to the truck. I put him in the cab of the truck. He embraced me. And he said, you saved my life, Mark. Whenever you get to the West Coast, let me know in advance. I want to have dinner with you and with Charles, too. And I said, OK, what, what's your report going to be? I'd like to tell Jones. He's so upset. He said, yeah, you can tell him that in every city in America, there are murders and attempted murders, and I don't hold it against this community, that one nut try to do something here because he was upset. He said, it will be in my report, but it will not be a major portion of the report, and I don't even think there'll be a congressional investigation because I've seen some positive things and some negative things. And I, went, and I gave that, all that information to Jones. Had Ryan not told me that, and had I been quick-witted enough to have thought of it, I would have made it up anyway, but it wasn't necessary because Ryan told me that. And so that diffused that first ticking bomb. Then the next one was, he said, well, listen, Every man who left here today left here to destroy our enemies, not because they wanted to leave here, but because they loved me to destroy our enemies. And I said, no, 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 listen, I talked to Jerry Parks and Dale Parks. They, they just couldn't take it anymore. Life was too rough. And they're not going to say an unkind thing about you, Jim. But they're not going to kill anybody for you. They're not going to destroy anybody. They just want to build a new life in California. Diffuse that one. And then he said, Larry Layton, he's the man now charged with murder in Georgetown. He said, Larry Layton, when he embraced me, it was a cold embrace. And I knew then he was out to destroy the enemy. I said, Jim, you're a rational person, which was perhaps overstating the matter at that time. I said, you can't operate on the mystic feeling of a cold embrace. You can't take action based on that. He said, all right, I'll tell you this. Charles Mark. Those people are going to shoot down, shoot up the plane, and I'll be blamed for it. I have proof. Well, I couldn't do anything with that one. He had proof, all right. He had sent them out, no doubt, to do it. I couldn't tell him it wasn't going to happen, because by then I believed he had ordered them to do that, and they were on their way. And as he was telling us that, they were dying at the airstrip just about that moment, and he knew that. At that point, Maria Katsaris came up and whispered to Jim Jones. They had a little conversation. He came back. He said, 
You too, pointed at Charles and myself. The people are very angry with you here, which was not true so far as I could see. He tended to confuse, as dictators often do, to confuse himself with the people. He was angry, and I understood why. And he said, go to the East House and stay there. And Jim McElvain said, I'll take them there. People have asked me since then if Jim McElvain was armed at the time. I don't know. It would not have made a great deal of difference. He was six feet nine inches tall and weighed 290 pounds. He was not just like a football player, professional football player. He was like a big professional football player. And he took us to the East House, the furthest most house to the east of the pavilion, maybe three or 400 yards away. And we were placed in the house and told to stay there, at which point Donald Sly, the man who had attempted, was involved in that assault on the congressman, came down and sat outside of the house to guard us. The choice of the guard was not terribly reassuring to me at that point. And then we heard Jim Jones start to broadcast. And when he spoke into the microphone, we could hear him. We could not hear anybody else because he had the microphone. We were perhaps 400 yards away. And he began to talk about the dignity of death and how we almost died. I was listening very closely to what he was saying. Sometimes I guess he turned away from the microphone. I could hear just phrases and words, bits and pieces, and couldn't hear the whole sentence. But I heard that much talk of death. And then I heard him say, oh, no, let's not argue among ourselves. Oh, no, let's not protest. Let's not argue among ourselves. Obviously, people were protesting as Stanley Clayton and Odell Rose later testified. And I heard his response to that. No, stop that. There's no need for that. No arguing among ourselves. And they were silenced. And then a group of about eight or ten men, young men, came charging down from the pavilion across the little bridge, which over a little stream, running straight toward the East House where Charles, Gary, and I were being guarded by Mr. Sly. And they were shouting, let's get them, let's bring them up. And I turned to Charles and said, this looks very bad. <laughs> that was my instant analysis at that time. And I began to think of what I was going to say up there. I thought we'd be going to be brought up to the meeting, charged with bringing the congressman in or the news media or some such thing. And I wanted to address myself to the concept of mass suicide. I just tried to, I thought I would not have a long time to make a speech, but I better try to figure out two or three phrases. And I was thinking of that when they ran right up to the house and then right past it. And there was a little shack beyond the house. I didn't even know it was there before that day. And the them was weapons they were talking about. One, I'm, everyone, people in Jonestown were very modestly dressed all the time. Although it was a tropical area, and I even played basketball the first day I was there with the team. No one ever took a shirt off, no man that I ever saw. They kept their shirt on all the time. And now all the men were stripped to the waist, wearing jungle fatigues and boots and nothing above their waist. And all the rules had changed. Obviously, something very dramatic was taking place. And these men ran over. And I remember one man very clearly. He took one semi-automatic weapon with a sling put over one shoulder, another one over the other shoulder, and held the third one up and ran up the hill. He had three. Others had three, four, five. Two men carried a heavy ammunition crate up the hill. And as they passed, they said to Sly, come with us, Sly. And he started to go up with them. And I said to Charles, let's get out of here. As soon as they get on that bridge, let's get out of here. At that point, two men came running down the hill. Poncho and Johnson were the only names I knew them as. Poncho had... Uh, had been very much concerned about my lecture about the murder of Dr. King back in September, talked with me with it, about it until the early hours of the morning back in September. And I'd sent him copies of the book I'd written with Dick Gregory called Codename Zorro about the murder of Dr. King. And he had read that book in the interim. And the night before Friday night, he'd been the master of ceremonies, just a marvelous, marvelously talented young man who sang and who acted and was the marvelous master of ceremonies at that performance. He came running down. Now he was carrying a semi-automatic weapon with his friend Johnson, and they were pointed at our house, the East House, where we were staying at that moment. And he said, all right, Charles Mark, come on out. And I, Charles Gary turned to me and said, I'm not going out. And I said, these walls are very thin wood, Charles. They will provide no protection. We're lawyers. The only skill we're supposed to have is the ability to talk. Let's go out and talk to these guys. He said, I'm not going. I went out and said, hello, Poncho. And he said, hello, Mark. And he said, we're all going to die. And he pointed this weapon at me. Well, he didn't point it like this, but he pointed at me, you might say casually, although that's not the word I would have chosen at the time. <laughs> and he said, we're all going to die. There's great dignity in death. This is the way we struggle against fascism. 
And I had prepared my little speech. I thought it was going to be for a larger audience. Now it was just two. But uh, it might have been my last one, so I thought I'd do the best I could. And I said, suicide is not a struggle. It's not even the absence of struggle. It is a denial of struggle. And killing little children is fascism. And he didn't respond. It was as if I had not said anything. He paused. He was polite. And then he waited till I finished, and then he started again. It was as if, but it was as if I had not said anything. He didn't respond. Yeah, I mean, he, had a, he had a commitment. He knew what was going to happen. He committed himself to it, I guess. And he said, we're all going to die, Mark. We are, it's beautiful. We're all going to die together. We are all going to die. He kept on saying we. I was wondering what was encompassed in his mind in that pronoun, we. Me and Charles? Should I say we're not even members? I, I didn't know how to approach it. I, I didn't want to ask him directly if he meant us because I thought his answer might be terribly disappointing. <laughs> and so I said, well, Pancho, at least you will know that Charles and I, we will tell the story of what happened here. And he looked up then for the first time as if I had said something which was a new thought to him. He said, yes, that's what you did about Dr. King. I read the book. And he walked up to me and put his arms around me and hugged me and said goodbye. Tell the truth. And then Johnson came down the hill and he hugged me and said goodbye as well. Then they hugged Charles and said goodbye to him and started to leave. When he went up a little bit up the hill, I said, oh, Pancho, and he spun around with his, his weapon pointed at us. And I thought Charles was going to kill me at that point. And he, he said, yes. And I said, how do we get out of here? And he said, when it's all over, call in a plane. And I said, I don't have a plane. You don't have a telephone. I don't know how that radio works. How do I walk out right now? Well, that, was, that confronted him with a bit of a test. I didn't think of it in those terms. That's the last thing I wanted to do. But as I look back on it now, he knew that I knew where the pavilion was. I mean, you can be in Jonestown for five minutes, and you know where the pavilion is. It's the center of everything. And the road from Jonestown to Port Kaituma is right down there from the pavilion. No way to miss it. So I could have gone that way. But if he had been ordered to kill us, of course, we could not show up where Jim Jones was. And so I guess it was a test for him. And he said, no, go that way. He pointed in exactly the opposite direction. He said, if you go that way, eventually you'll hit the road to Port Kaituma. At that point, he held the weapon up in the air and said, Jim Jones is the greatest man who ever lived. And Charles Gary made his first comment. Then he said, right on. <laughs> and they left. And I said to Charles, let's go. And we started. I took this little case that I had. And Charles picked up this big, old-fashioned lawyer's briefcase. Charles is just 70 years old now and uh, has this old, he must have had this uh, briefcase from the day he was admitted to practice. It's a gigantic, old-fashioned briefcase, very heavy. And he picked it up and started to go. It was very rough terrain. It was not the bush. It was an open area, but very, very rough. And of course, there were snakes that day. We knew that. But uh, there was a ravine we had to go into. And there was a little stream at the bottom of the ravine. We were told there were piranha in the stream didn't mean a thing. We just plunged right in and ran right up the other side. And there were vines all over the place. And Charles began to trip, and I helped him up. And he said he's exhausted. He needed a rest. And we stopped for a moment. And we heard Jones say, Jim Jones called his wife Marcy mother. And she was the strongest opponent of any talk about suicide. She thought it was all crazy. And she said that. Every time Jones talked about suicide, if she was around, she said, that's crazy. We're never going to do that. Don't even talk about that. And no doubt she was then speaking out as clearly and as loudly as she could without the benefit of the microphone. And then he said, we heard him broadcast very loud, mother, 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 drowning her out, no doubt. And then I heard 80 to 90 rounds of automatic or semi-automatic rifle fire. I said to Charles, let's get up. We've got to get over the peak of that hill. When we pass, get down over the crest, we will not be able to be seen from there. And he said, I, I have to have a longer rest. And I said, look, Charles, I'm 20 years younger than you are. I play basketball. I swim all the time. I will use all of my energy for both of us. I swear I will never leave you behind. But let's do everything we can to get to the crest of that hill. That's the first point we have to reach now. He said, OK. And, I, and he picked up that briefcase. And I said, I'll take that for you. I just had a light pack over my shoulder. And it was remarkably heavy. I couldn't believe it. I said, let's throw the damn thing out. He said, no, I need it. I said, OK. And I picked it up, and we went up the hill. It was very rough terrain. We finally got to the crest and, and took a break at the side of the, the bush, right near the bush. And I put down the briefcase. I dropped it, and it popped open. And I looked in it. And in it was a very large 
hair dryer. I said, Charles, we are carrying a hair dryer through the jungle. He said, it's a very good hair dryer. I said, when we get back to the United States, if we get back to the United States, I will buy you a new one. He said, no, I'm going to keep that one. And then I said, can I see what else you have in here? He said, sure. Big, thick files. And I said, what are they? That was the rest of the weight, just about. He said, those are People's Temple files. I'm a lawyer for People's Temple, and I need them. I'm not throwing those out either. And I said, well, listen, Charles. It's true that you have not been fired as the attorney for, by People's Temple, but they sent the firing squad to our cabin, and I think you're relieved of all responsibility. And he said, no, I'm going to keep that with me. We carried that with us for the next 24 hours through the jungle, as a matter of fact. I should tell you a little bit. I don't think Charles would mind. Maybe he would. I'll explain the hair dryer. Uh, it, you probably have seen pictures of Charles Gary. It looks like he has hair like everybody else who has hair. He has hair in a different way from the way most people have hair. He's totally, completely bald, except here. And this hair from the side, the fringes, grows down about three feet. And if, this, if you think it was not bizarre enough to be running through the bush ordinarily, but with Charles, with his hair all coming down and streaming over his back and totally bald, and what he does with the hair dryer is he, he wraps his hair around, sprays with lacquer, then sprays it with the, then puts the hair dryer on so that it looks like it just grows normally. And he carries that hair dryer everywhere, I found out to my astonishment and dismay <laughs> that day in the jungle. But we went down, we find, and at that point, I said, is this really the way you think to the road? He said, yes. He said, look at that giant tree. And there was one huge tree almost on the horizon. And he said, I remember we passed that tree. It was on our right side when we came up the Jonestown Road from Port Kaituma. And he was right. We made for the tree, and he was right about that, absolutely right. And we walked up, and there was the road. And, he, and I said, let's not walk on the road. Those maniacs might still be around here. Let's stay here. So we stayed with the road to our left. Between us and the road were the cassava trees, maybe 25 yards of them, providing some light cover. And to our right, the impenetrable jungle, this bush. It's the last unexplored jungle in the world goes to Brazil, Venezuela, Guyana. And it, we, I knew that it abounded with all kinds of things that I would not like to meet. There, was, there are jaguars living in there. In fact, just a few miles away, a Guyanese went hunting from Port Kaituma with three dogs and uh, was treed by a jaguar who ripped his arm off at the elbow, and then he had dogs with him. That was just a few miles. I didn't know that that night, fortunately. But there were also ocelot there and boa constrictors, scorpions, tarantulas, and bats. Bats would fly in flocks of 20, sometimes 100. And they had a special uh, attribute, which I found very disconcerting they, uh, hearing about. They, had, they secreted an anticoagulant in their saliva. So when they bit you, you just kept right on bleeding. But none of it, none of it seemed very hospitable. But compared with what was outside of the jungle, people with the weapons, it, the jungle appeared somewhat hospitable. But in any event, we were on the side near the bush. And at that point, it was getting dark, just about dusk. And we saw three men on the other side of the road, dressed in fatigues. One of them held a footlocker on his back. And I said to Charles, let's go. We, and I ran, panicked, ran into the jungle, ran into the bush to escape them. And we zigzagged as we ran in there, so they could not follow us too easily. And we heard footsteps following us. You always hear footsteps there because it's a rainforest and it's always raining. Even it's raining no place else in the whole world is raining there because the leaves are always wet and they drip. And as you hear them dripping, it sounds like footsteps coming towards you or going away from you. We never did hear any footsteps going away from us, but we heard many footsteps coming toward us during the night. And we heard these steps. We heard something, and there was obviously something was moving there, probably some animal. We heard twigs being broken, something moving toward us. And we saw a flashlight moving in from the road area toward us. It was getting closer and closer. And we hid behind a fallen log. And I felt something uh, itching. My hands began to itch. In the morning, we saw there were giant red ants, which had bitten us all of our arms and legs. But that also didn't seem like much of a problem at that point. But we were hiding behind this log. And the, this flashlight came close. And when it got very close, we saw there was a giant firefly. We spent the night there because there was no way to move at night. It was dark. You've heard of, being, of it being so dark, you cannot see your hand. It was literally that dark. You could see absolutely nothing. Even at noon, it's not very bright in there. There's a triple canopy, the jungle trees go up 150 feet. But uh, during the nighttime, it was very, very dark. And Charles said, 
Mark, why do you think there was a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King? I said, Charles, I don't want to talk about that. He said, I thought you'd talk about that. I said, I want to talk about how we're going to get out, get out of here in the morning. How deep are we? He said, I know the way. It's right over there. I said, are you pointing? He said, yes. I said, let me see. Oh, because we could not see anything. And I felt it. I said, I think it's the other direction. I said, but that's the whole problem. I mean, we're lost. It's the last unexplored jungle of the world. We've never been in the bush at night. People who know the area, who get in here at night, get lost, can't find their way out in the daytime. I, we have to consider some scientific method of getting out of here. He said, well, we can follow the sun. I said, we don't even know if we want to go north, east, south, or west. We don't know where the road is from here, what direction. Said, anyway, we won't see the sun. So dense in here. We'll just see it when it's at noon. And I said, I don't know. I said, you remember anything about moss on trees? You ever a Boy Scout? You ever hear about that, Charles? I said, but that only helps if we know what that means and what direction we want to go in. I don't even know either of those two things. He said, Mark, I have an excellent sense of direction. I said, you really do? And I was buoyed by that. I was beginning to panic, thinking that we would never get out of there. He said, yes, I have never been lost once in San Francisco. <laughs> well, I was encouraged by that. He said, however, in Los Angeles, I get lost all the time. I was not encouraged anymore. He said, anyway, Mark, I've been in a forest before. I said, this is not a forest. This is the last unexplored bush in the world. And then I, I kept on thinking that there must be some scientific something we can do. And then I remembered about the shorts that I had purchased. I had three pair of shorts when the laundry in Jonestown. I wasn't proposing to go back and get them. But the other three were in a plastic case, never been opened. And about a year before, at the John Kennedy Airport in New York City, when I was changing planes and had a lot of extra time, I went into one of those Hoffert stores, which sells precision knives and various things like that, scissors. And there was a very good salesman there. And he said, I have just the thing that you need. I said, what do I need? He said, this precision folding scissors in a little leather case. I said, what do I need that for? He said, to trim your mustache. You'll find it really will come in handy. Well, I bought it, and I never used it once. It was there in my toilet kit. Had it for a year, never used, used it one time. But then I said, listen, Charles, I got these three pair of white shorts, and I have a scissors. We can cut it up into 100 strips. We'll go the direction that you say is the right way to go. We're about 175, 150 yards from the road. We'll go in the direction you say, and we'll mark every couple of feet with a, with a cotton strip. If that's not the right way, we'll follow the strips back, pick them up, and find our way back here. If this is the base camp, if this is the hub, and we keep on straight, striking out in different directions, spokes from the hub, eventually we'll hit the road, as long as we can always get back here. I said, that's the problem about being lost. You go some direction, then you don't know where you are. But if we can always find our way back here, I said, eight or 10 days, you know, we can live that long. Well, I mean, food, he said, eight or 10 days. I said, yeah, there's all the water we need. That's no problem. Gigantic philodendron leaves. We can catch all the water that falls in there. It was raining a good part of the time. I said, we don't need food for eight or 10 days. If nothing gets us, we'll uh, find our way out of here. He said, eight or 10 days? Look, Mark, I'm going to be on that one o'clock flight from Georgetown. I got commitments back in San Francisco. <laughs> he, was, he was never realized. He never dealt with the, the problem at that time. He hadn't, not during the whole night. And at 6 o'clock in the morning at first light, I began to cut up these little strips. And he said, I know the way. Don't waste our time doing that. I want to be on that plane. And he took off. And I said, wait. But he went ahead, and I tried to put these strips behind. But he had gone very quickly. And I finally caught him. And the direction he was going was not the direction of the road. We'd gone a couple hundred yards, and we were lost. It was exactly 7.45. I know that because at that time, I heard people running through the bush, screaming. And I heard 15 to 20 more rounds of rifle fire, semi-automatic or automatic. And we were lost and could not find our way back to our little hub, our base camp, because we had not put down enough white strips. It took us several hours, finally, to find one strip and then another, and we finally found our way back. And I said, all right, now, Charles, humor me this time. We cut up all the shorts. And every three or four feet, I put a little piece of cotton so that if you look down, you could see seven in a row at least seven in a row. We weren't going get, to get lost from that base camp. And we used that method. Within a few hours, the method worked. Within a few hours, we found our way to the road. And when we got to the road, I said, look, here it is. But you know, we don't know who's at that outpost down at the end of the road. We have no idea who's there. And he said, I don't care. I'm just going to walk down that road and get out of here. I said, Charles, after all we've gone through now, it would be a terrible tragedy to get shot down by some maniac at the guardhouse down there. 
He said, well, what do you suggest? I said, I suggest that we go right back into the bush, just five feet from the road where we'll always see the road and spend the night there. I said, you know, there were a thousand Americans up here. Some of them are running around in the bush. The United States government's going to turn that muddy little dirt road into a military installation highway by tomorrow morning when the word gets out. Then we heard a helicopter. Then we saw the helicopter. And we heard and saw a fixed wing plane and then another helicopter circling over the Jonestown area. And I said, they've discovered it. They know that a lot of people died and a lot of people are running around the jungle. And if they're not in here yet, it's because they're afraid they're maniacs with guns, very likely. They're going to have to move slowly. But let's wait. And he said, well, let's get closer to the guardhouse. And we got close to the guardhouse, but stayed in the jungle, near the jungle. And then at one point, he said, I've had it. And he ran out right to the, the outpost. And he picked up a stick, which was holding up a banana tree. He flung open the door with the stick raised. And there was nobody there, no person there, the two little piglets rooting around. And I walked up to him and said, Charles, that was the bravest thing I've ever seen done. And he said, you mean the most stupid. Well, his judgment may not have been too good, but he certainly was psychic, because uh, that's what I was thinking. And then uh, we left. But he was right. Because the United States government never sent anyone to look for the people in the jungle. No one. Never sent a helicopter, the radio, broadcasting, nothing. And even now, with the incomplete list, it appears that over 100 people died who are not accounted for, disappeared. And I have no doubt that many of them died in that bush because they were not as fortunate as Charles and I were. First of all, we were only 150 to 175 yards from that road, and we knew that. Secondly, we had scissors and things to make markers out of, and we were adults. There are a lot of little children who ran who were missing, who no doubt escaped the massacre and ran into the perimeter and had no idea where the road was. They had left home because they thought their country, their government, did not care enough about them, because they sensed a callous about them, because they sensed a callous indifference toward them, because they were poor and because they were black. And if anything, the government of the United States, in, its, in their last minutes, the last minutes of Jonestown, underscored the accuracy of their belief. Just imagine if at about that same time, the Vietnamese announced that they had discovered the body of a lieutenant colonel, POW and wanted to return him, what would have happened? Kissinger and Vance flying over there in Air Force One, a mahogany and brass coffin bringing back the body to Andrews Air Force Base, where members of Congress and the President and the United States Air Force Band and the Marine Corps Band would participate in a ceremony. But how about for some live American who was slowly dying in the jungle? Nothing. Fifteen years ago, after John Kennedy was assassinated, I traveled around this country raising questions in college campuses, raising questions about it. The same kind of false campaign of falsification appeared in the news media then as appearing now. It's a little bit more virulent now than it was at that time, not much more. And I never could understand it, how everywhere, every television program I went on to discuss the problem, local TV programs, how much money you're making doing this? Well, the answer was really not much. In fact, almost nothing. But nevertheless, that question came up. Aren't you profiteering from the death of John Kennedy? The question came up everywhere. It was not until a couple of years ago, when under the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to secure CIA files that I discovered. But in CIA files, a program was established by the Central Intelligence Agency to discredit me and to destroy my reputation, similar to the intelligence organizations against Dr. King, to destroy him, about which the Church Committee has published documents now. It said, CIA said, this is to be sent to every station chief of the Central Intelligence Agency in every country throughout the world. We are to utilize our assets in the news media in the United States and other countries to destroy the reputation of Mark Lane. Point number one, always ask him how much money he's making. See if he's financially interested. Call him a death profiteer, etc. That was in 1966, and that's when the campaign began and is still moving forward at the present time.
the government of the united states i believe will do almost anything to keep the american people from securing the facts of what happened regarding the death of president kennedy dr king and now this disaster this tragedy in jonestown but now the congress of the united states i mean all the stories that you have no doubt read in esquire the new york times and elsewhere heard about even in the local newspaper your own school newspaper today talking about how much money i'm being paid was it said anywhere in there that in 1975 i formed the citizens commission of inquiry to encourage the congress to look into the kennedy assassination and then the kennedy and king assassination and that i lectured all over america in 1975 and 1976, and that I did make $80,000 lecturing on the college campus, and that I gave every penny to the Citizens Commission of Inquiry so that investigation could take place, so that a million letters and telegrams could flow into Washington, so we could hire people to brief members of Congress and congressional aides. And that was 90% of my income during that period of time. Has that been reported anywhere in your local school newspaper or in Esquire magazine or the New York Times? New York Times ran a full story about me, but before doing so, John Crutzen, who wrote it, who was one of the hitmen for the intelligence organizations at the New York Times, met me in San Francisco at the Empress of China restaurant with a man named Bill Carlson, another New York Times reporter, and asked me question after question after question, and there was another person present. And I answered every question. Then he said, well, I have a few more. Would you go with me to the Holiday Inn in Chinatown, where, where his hotel was? And we went there and talked for a couple more hours. And I ended up saying, is there anything else, any other question you have? And he said, no, you've answered every question. I'm satisfied. And I said, well, here's my hotel in San Francisco. I'll be here for a couple of more days, the Wharf Hotel. I gave him the number, went back to the hotel. The next morning, he called my law partner. He said, how would Mark Lane respond to this question about the fact there's a disbarment proceeding, which is what the school newspaper ran today, which is untrue, an invention, a figment of imagination of the New York Times and the Washington Post? How would he respond to that? How would he respond to this and that? And she said, well, look, why don't you call him? She hadn't known that I'd spent hours with him the night before. Why don't you call him? Why don't you ask him? She said, he said, no, I don't want to bother him. She said, well, the whole thing's absurd. The next day, the New York Times ran in a very prominent position, an article by John Crutzen with all of the false charges against me with the statement, Mr. Lane was unavailable for comment. After five hours of talking with him and answering every question the night before, his statement was Mr. Lane was unavailable for comment. However, his law partner said all she could say is that the charges seemed to her to be absurd. That's the New York Times, high standard of journalism. When Terry Buford, who depicted from the People's Temple, was staying with my family, she's a young, attractive woman and a dear friend of mine now. This is how the New York Times reports, how Esquire reports it. Reports it. Terry Buford is now living with Mark Lane in Memphis. Yes, and with the other members of my family as well. When she was living with my family in Memphis, I was invited to appear on a French network television program to discuss cults. And I went there, and on that program was the editor of the Washington Post, two of the journalists from the San Francisco Chronicle, two members of parliament from France. And I did that program and flew back to America. Charles, B uh, David Binder of the New York Times called my home in Memphis and talked to Terry Buford and said, where is Mark Lane now? And she said, well, he's unavailable. He's on a plane flying from Paris to New York. The New York Times ran a feature story the next day saying that at this point, Terry Buford and Mark Lane are in Zurich, Switzerland, according to the United States Department of Justice. He had just talked to Terry Buford. 901 is not the area code for Zurich, Switzerland. It is for Memphis, Tennessee. And Mr. Binder knew that. According to uh, Robert Havel of the Department of Justice, said Mr. Binder, Mr. Lane, and Ms. Buford are in Zurich, Switzerland. And they have discovered, the Department of Justice states, that after Mark Lane and Terry Buford were reportedly seen there, the $8 million was reportedly missing from the People's Temple Bank account in Zurich. And that was the day before Terry Buford was to go to San Francisco and testify before the grand jury. And they knew she was terrified about going back to that city for fear that the People's Temple people might kill her. Now, in addition to everything else, it was said that we had stolen the money from People's Temple. The Department of Justice knew because Terry Buford had given them all the documents three weeks before that there was no money in Switzerland. That all the People's Temple money was in a Swiss bank in Panama. And so while the money was in Panama, I was in Paris, and Terry was in Memphis, and the New York Times knew all of that. They reported that all three of us were together. 
Terry and me and the money in Zurich. A front page story of which they knew every word was a lie. And when I talked to Mr. Binder the next day, and of course the story was Mr. Lane was unavailable for comment. Well, that was true. I was on a plane at the only time he called. But I found out about it as soon as the story was written and said, everything's a lie. He said, well, I'm sorry if we've done you any inconvenience. I said, well, all lies in the New York Times do everybody an inconvenience. He, sa he said, well, I'll print the other side of it. I said, I don't want the other side of it. I want you to call French TV. Talk to the French government. They picked me up at the airport. They took me to the hotel. They took me to the television station. They brought me back. I said, while you were reporting that I was in Zurich, I was talking to about 150 American reporters who had called and had a little press conference in Paris. Now, that's something you can check with the French government. And I said, and while you and CBS were both reporting that Terry Buford was in Zurich, Michael Lawhead, a CBS television on-camera interviewer, CBS affiliate in Memphis, was talking to Terry. He's, he's a friend of ours, was at my home talking with Terry. I said, I don't want you to run the story Mark Lane denies. The, here's all the information. Check it out with everybody so you can report the truth. And I hear all the documents I said to show you that the money, in fact, was in Panama. So every aspect of the story was untrue. Now, I don't want a Mark Lane deny story, and then re you repeat the charge. You just say, I said, it's not true. He said, no, it'll be a very competent story. They ran the story the next day. Department of Justice said Mark Lane was there, Terry Buford, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, however, Mark Lane denied it. That's what the New York Times calls presenting. That's what they call all the news that's fit to print, the New York Times. Or what Walter Cronkite says, that's the way it was, and it almost never is. That's part of the problem. I could tell you a hundred stories about misinformation. Stephen Brill, a reporter, asked me about it tonight. Stephen Brill, a reporter for Esquire, said, isn't it true that you told Stephen Katsaris that you were a reporter for Esquire when you interviewed him? I just left Stephen Katsaris. Story, front page headline story, saying a California psychiatrist, Stephen Katsaris, said that Mark Lane said he came from Esquire magazine, therefore Lane should be disbarred for not saying he was a lawyer involved in the case. I talked to Stephen Katsaris. I have a statement from him. He said, you never said that. Brill lied. Crutes in the New York Times lied. I never said that you said that. And I said, well, I know that because I had tape recorded in my conversation with Mr. Katsaris. Put the tape down. I said, can I do this? He said, sure. And he said, which Mark Lane are you? It's all on the tape. And he concedes this. I said, I don't know how many there are. I'm an author and a lawyer. He said, you wrote Rush to Judgment? I said, yes. He said, well, I read it a long time ago when it came out in 1966. I could tell you a thousand stories about press misinformation, disinformation, but I'll tell you what the bottom line will be on this. I will be bringing in the near future a multi-million dollar law action against the Central Intelligence Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Esquire Magazine, CBS, New York Times, and the rest of the assorted organizations which publish Intelligence Committee handouts. And I'm going to do that because it's, there is no way the American people can get the facts about any of the events which affect our lives the Kennedy assassination, the King assassination, the war in Vietnam, the massacre at Jonestown, as long as the news media is not free, as long as in these sensitive areas it is totally responsive to the intelligence organizations. I just recommend very strongly that you get a chance to look at, maybe it's in the library here, if not, try to find it. Rolling Stone, October 20th, 1977. Make a note of that if you would. It's a piece by Carl Bernstein of Woodward and Bernstein about the grip in which the Central Intelligence Agency has grasped the American news media. 400 employees of the CIA working in the American news media over the years. It's an agreement, a written agreement between Arthur Hayes Salzberg of the New York Times and the Central Intelligence Agency about how the agency is to utilize the New York Times and CBS and the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times and the rest of them. Read it, Newsweek magazine. Read it. It's October 20th, 1977. It will probably be the most frightening and chilling document you can read about the American news media, but it's important to do that. It's important to have some understanding of how the news reaches you and what it goes through in order to reach you. But now we have, that is a matter which is very much on the agenda for the American people, and so is the story of Jonestown. Fifteen years ago, I raised the question all over this country almost as a lone voice saying that there was evidence, hard forensic evidence, to establish the fact that there had been a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy, that shots had come from two different directions. And one of the main voices for suppression, as a matter of fact, was a man in Des Moines, Iowa, David Bellin, who invented the fanciful magic bullet theory, who I think remains the last person in America who believes the Warren Commission report. 
but the Congress of the United States was finally persuaded to investigate, looked at all of the evidence, there was no new evidence, but looked at all the old evidence, and concluded in a report which it has already announced and which it will report in detail about toward the end of this month, but its conclusions have already been published, that there was a conspiracy to kill John F. Kennedy, that for 15 years your government has not told you the truth, nor has your news media told you the truth about that conspiracy. That in all probability, the, the Congress said, after its two and a half year investigation, that there was a conspiracy to kill Dr. King as well, that the FBI misled you and your news media misled you there. Events are moving very quickly now in the Middle East, in Iran, in Africa, in Asia. We no longer have the luxury to be patient, to wait 15 years to learn what happened in Jonestown, as we did in the Kennedy case, or a decade as we did in the case of the murder of Dr. King. We must be impatient with our government now and with our news media now. We must become informed and we must insist that now all of the facts be made known about this latest American tragedy. And that is a responsibility which no one person can carry. I don't mind the attacks. I expect them, and I expect to be fully and richly rewarded when we finally get before a jury because of the falsification of the record by the news media. And the greatest reward will be seeing Mr. Kruitz and Mr. Brill and the rest of them testify. Because I tell you one thing, when you get to court and you raise your hand, you don't so easily make false statements as you do when you write a newspaper article. And they're going to be in a great, it'll be a great moment for them when they have to decide which way they want to go when the evidence is presented about what they have done. But this is not a job for one person. 900 of our sisters and brothers died a long way from home in search of a dream. And we, all of us, have a responsibility to find out why they died. Why the government of the United States sent Congressman Ryan into Jonestown, not knowing that he would die, but knowing that he might die, and why they deceived him. And getting that information is a responsibility that all of us share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take the question. Mr. Lane, we thank you. We will wait, I think, in view of the hour, a few minutes for those who wish to leave to leave, those who wish to ask questions stay. Um, the chair will open with one question while the people are going. The second in command, Tim Jones, was that the name? What was his fear about the loss of people that he, that he so thoroughly sold to Jones? You made the statement that if he had, if, if he had, it was he who had convinced Jim Jones that if one left, all was lost. What was his motivation? Well, by then, Tim Stone had uh, turned, had left People's Temple, and was, and was basically in charge of the campaign to destroy Jim Jones and People's Temple. Why he was doing that, I don't know. But that's what he was doing without any question. He was one of the people who went to Congressman Ryan and urged Congressman Ryan to go to Jonestown. He had uh, been responsible for newspaper articles attacking Jim Jones and People's Temple and had developed great hostility toward Jones. And he was able, through Tim Carter, to convince Jones that if one person left, they would be destroyed. He was the adversary and predicting victory on his part if one person left. What his motivation is, I don't know. But it's the central question, I think. And uh, I can tell you this, that I did a television program with Terry Buford in Memphis, Tennessee, in which I outlined the role of Timothy Stone. And Terry Buford outlined it much more clearly because she had been his aide for seven years. And I ended up by saying, where is law enforcement? This man was an assistant district attorney. Where is law enforcement in this country? And I received a visit from the Deputy Attorney General of California, Timothy Reardon, who told me that based upon the statements that we had made and the questions we had raised and other information which they had secured, they had established a task force on Timothy Stone to deal with the very question you have asked, why did he do it and what did he do? And uh, Terry has 
given them all the information in her possession about Stone, so have I, and it's an ongoing investigation. It's very it's difficult to ever predict what the result of an investigation will be before it's completed, but my own feeling in meeting with Mr. Reardon, the Deputy Attorney General of California, is that he's conducting a serious and responsible and will conduct a thorough investigation. And uh, I believe that the answer to your question will be forthcoming perhaps uh, when the Attorney General issues his report or some other action is taken in California by the Attorney General's office. Yeah, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. The question is, uh, I guess you didn't hear it back there. The question is, why do I think that the government should have acted upon the information which they had secured when, in fact, Terry Buford, who was the source of information to me, told me that she didn't think there would be any uh, violent action against any of the uh, guests or visitors? I'm not critical of the government for not taking action. I've met with members of the families, uh, members of families who have lost people in Jonestown. And they are very emotional about this and very angry about it. And they are critical of the government for not taking action. But I am not critical of the government for, taking, for not taking action because I can't think of anything they could have done. These were mostly adults, no unattached children so far as I can see, adults who brought children with them. They voluntarily left the confines of the United States, continental limits, went someplace else. Knowing something about People's Temple, they went there. They were living in a foreign country. And if everything the government heard about them, 200 weapons, 300 weapons, beatings, all of that, if all of that were true, I don't think there's anything the United States government could do. Legally, I don't think there's anything they could do. Uh, Guyana was a, is a socialist country, not unfriendly in terms of its relationship with us, not all that friendly either. We could have asked the government of Guyana to do something, perhaps. The government of Guyana had its own concerns. They were very anxious to encourage people to move into the interior and to develop the interior of the country. Nobody was doing that except Jonestown, except the Americans who had gone in. What could the United States government have done? I, Terry Buford told me that she believed that 90% of the people in Jonestown, that nobody was really happy there because the food was so bad and the hours were so long and conditions were so difficult, but that 90% of the people would have fought to the death in the effort by the United States government to make them come back. If they were invited back, if they felt they were free to return and they went voluntarily, that would have been one thing. But if the Marines landed and tried to bring her back, she said that she'd fight. She thought they would fight. Well, what could the government do then? No one had been harmed, that is. No one could predict that very likely everyone would die if the congressman went there, if anything else happened. No one could predict that. How can you expect an administration to look at a situation where they're getting reports that there are no very serious problems there, to go in there and, and send a military operation in there in which people would die? And certainly we would all have been very critical. Just think, suppose the massacre had not taken place. And instead, the Marines had landed, tried to liberate some people, shots were fired, and a lot of people were killed. They moved to impeach the president for that action. So I'm not critical of the government for not doing anything. I don't think there's anything they could have done other than to wait. Just let nature take its course. They would have gone to the Soviet Union, I believe. And if they'd gone to the Soviet Union, although that would have been very embarrassing for us, they could have left the Soviet Union to come to the United States if they wanted to. There would be no guns pointed at them. Americans can leave the Soviet Union to come back home. Lee Harvey Oswald did it. State Department paid his way even after he renounced his American citizenship in the American Embassy in Moscow. The State Department paid his way back. So I'm not critical of the government for, taking, for not taking action. I'm critical of them for taking action. All they had to do was say to Congressman Ryan, there's a problem, don't go. I tell you, I was telling him not to go. It's true Terry told me she thought in all probability nothing was going to happen, but she wasn't sure. There was enough of a doubt for me to not want to go. And if it was up to me as to whether that delegation was going to go or not go, I assure you it would never have left the United States. And I made that position very well known. It was only her telling me that since the delegation was going that I might be useful in calming it down if there was a problem that made me go. 
So I'm not critical of the government for not taking some kind of action. I'm critical of them for precipitating a situation. For in that, knowing that Jim Jones was somewhat mad, knowing there were many weapons there, for failing to tell Congress and Ryan the truth, and for sending him there, in, sending him in there, ill-prepared to meet the problem. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I've represented a lot of people who are, uh, I'm a lawyer. I, I represent people charged with murder. I've represented people, I must confess, who committed murders. We all do that. All members of the bar who try criminal cases represent all kinds of people. But th that's part of the answer, but there's more than that. When I went in there in September, I saw how nervous he was, how upset he was, and I was concerned about the other people that were there. And I was concerned about a program to destroy him and to destroy that operation. My only, my only criticism now is that I didn't give up everything else and devote every second, every waking second of my life from the time I got out of Jonestown to a Freedom of Information action. I didn't because of a number of reasons, because they said they were going to provide documents to me, which they never did provide, and there were reasons why I couldn't proceed. I had other commitments to James Earl Ray, et cetera. But uh, I'm, I'm only sorry that if I had known what was going to happen, not only would I not have walked away from representing Jim Jones, I would have brought everybody I knew in the country, every lawyer I know, into a massive action under the Freedom of Information Act to get information to reassure him. So he would not be brought to that point. I mean, it's easy to walk away from difficult situations, but it's not always the proper thing to do. Yeah. What was the motivation of the guards? I don't know. Yeah, I've thought about that because they were pointing those weapons at me. I've thought about that since that time. They were committed. Now, I don't know. Uh, you see, one of the problems about the failure of the government to, of the United States government to pick up the bodies and conduct autopsies and make identifications at once is that to this day we don't know who escaped and who didn't escape. More than a hundred people who were there are not accounted for. Debbie Blakey said that there were two to three hundred weapons in there, semi-automatic weapons. They found forty. Now, either she was wrong in her estimate, but I don't think she could have been that wrong in her estimate, or some people left with weapons. I saw three people walking out. I know three other people walked out and had some money and some guns. We heard about that because they were picked up by the Guyanese police. Uh, what those, who those guards were, why they were involved in that action, I don't know. If, whether there was an intelligence presence in there, I don't know. One of the witnesses said that after, that he was hiding out in the bush, that after the shooting had died down and after many had died there, he heard the guards cheering, an organized hip hip hooray cheer which went on and on. Uh, I don't know if that preceded them killing th themselves, which I'm inclined to doubt, or preceded their leaving. Who they were and what they were doing, I don't know, but that's certainly the most important question, and it's one I'm anxious to get the answer to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, about the adoption of the child. Um, by Jim Jones. The child was never really adopted. Uh, Jim Jones said that he was the father of a child which took place as a result of a union between himself and Grace Stone. Grace Stone was the wife of Tim Stone, who was the counsel for People's Temple. Tim Stone, in an affidavit, said that that was true, that he was happy that uh, Jim Jones was the natural father of that child, that uh, he had asked Jim Jones to become the father. The problem with, the, with this is that while Tim Stone assured Jim Jones that he knew he was the father and therefore he would never try to take the child away from him, but in many states, including California, the law is quite strict on the question. If a man and woman get married, and on the wedding night before the marriage is even consummated, the husband goes off to serve as a soldier of fortune somewhere and comes back ten years later and finds that his wife now has eight children, he's the father of all eight children in most states. This is, these are laws designed. Uh, the interest of public policy to protect the sanctity of the family. If the wife has a child, the husband is the father. Whether he could possibly be the father or not, he is the father. And uh, what Jim Jones, I think, did not know that. He felt this was his child. He was the natural father. He was going to take the child with him. And Tim Stone said, it's perfectly all right. You are the father. Grace doesn't want the child. I want you to have the child. And he left the child behind in Jonestown. Anyone who knew Jim Jones would know that 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 commitment which Jones had to his own flesh and blood would be overriding over everything else. 
and uh, that if any effort was made to take that child from him, which, which is what Tim Stone then tried to do. Tim Stone and Grace Stone said they were living together, which was not true, as husband and wife. They had separated, and that they wanted their child back. And the courts in Guyana, following established English common law, ordered Jim Jones to surrender the child. Does that clarify it? Oh, Tim Stone's motivation for doing it. I think that it's possible that his motivation was to destroy Jim Jones and destroy Jones family. Okay, just one more question. I'm sorry. Okay, here. Well, are there any investigations going on? Yes, there are several investigations. The grand jury, the federal grand jury, is meeting now in San Francisco and has been for some months and will continue on with this in investigation. However, that grand jury cannot look into the role of Tim Stone, which I think may be central. And the reason they cannot is that Tim Stone is a good friend of the U.S. Attorney of San Francisco. And he served with him in the district attorney's office, the city district attorney's office, with Mr. Hunter. And in fact, when Mr. Hunter was made U.S. Attorney for San Francisco, he offered Tim Stone the job of Chief Criminal Assistant. That's how close he is. So he's not permitted to look into the actions of Tim Stone. In addition to that, there's an investigation by the San Francisco District Attorney, Mr. Freitas, but Mr. Freitas had hired Tim Stone to work for him. And so he is proscribed by law from investigating the role of Tim Stone. And uh, it, it's sort of, I think, like examining uh, the role of the Nazis during World War II, but never being able to mention Adolf Hitler's name. I think it becomes difficult to conduct these investigations without even making reference to Timothy Stone. However, the Attorney General of California is conducting an investigation into the actions of Timothy Stone. So those are the three investigations which are ongoing, in addition to the House International Relations Committee, which is conducting an investigation, and uh, which is now in Guyana, I believe, and which will probably hold public hearings sometime in the near future. I don't have a great deal of faith in any of those investigations, uh, with the exception of the, I have a great deal of hope for the investigation by the Attorney General's Office of California. Thank you very much. It has been interesting to watch the faces. <clears throat> Mr. Lane held this crowd, what's left here, two hours and a half, which is longer than a full-length movie and there were no real signs of boredom. We thank you, Mr. Lane. We're adjourned.